Hello, I'm David McCullough. Welcome to the American Experience. Fear of powerful forces let loose by amazing machines and amazing science is an old story in American life from as far back as the days of steam. You remember the scene in Huckleberry Finn. It's night on the river and suddenly a steamboat bursts out of the dark and the fog bearing down on Huck and Jim on their raft. And all of a sudden she bulged out big and scary with a long row of wide open furnace doors shining like red hot teeth. There was a yell at us and a jingling of bells to stop the engines, a powwow of cussing, and as Jim went overboard on one side and I on the other, she came smashing straight through the raft. Our film is about another moment of terror on another American river in our own atomic age. The year was 1979, yet here again were furnaces big and scary, but they were nuclear. And again there was a very big powwow of cussing, but this time among citizens, scientists, and officials. This was reality, and as word spread, the terror was felt everywhere. Even after so many years, the thought of what could have happened is enough to stop the heart. Many of us remember where and when we heard the first bulletins from Three Mile Island. Though far away, I felt particularly connected. Our oldest son was in college in Pennsylvania, less than a hundred miles downwind from the site. And the governor of the state, Dick Thornburg, was an old friend from boyhood. I tried to imagine what it was like for him with all those lives at stake. Meltdown at Three Mile Island. It was built on a sandbar called Three Mile Island in the middle of Pennsylvania's Susquehanna River, just 10 miles downstream from the state capital of Harrisburg. The plant's state-of-the-art Unit 2 reactor had been generating electricity for nearly a year. Three Mile Island was something, uh, you, you know, you'd go to the river and you'd, you'd say, wow, look at that power plant, look at those big steam towers. And I was just amazed, wide-eyed and, and, you know, looking at the thing, and it was just kind of neat. It was uh, high technology and this was, uh, it was going to be power that was too cheap to, to meter. People in the communities surrounding the plant had grown accustomed to the giant concrete fortress. For them, Wednesday, March 28, 1979, began like any other day. They didn't yet know that events leading to the worst nuclear accident in American history had already been set in motion. It started in the pre-dawn hours with a simple plumbing breakdown. Then a small valve opened to relieve pressure in the reactor. But unknown to the plant operators, it malfunctioned and failed to close. This in turn caused cooling water to drain from the open valve. The nuclear core began to overheat. Technical failures were then compounded by human error. Confronted by baffling and contradictory readings, the operators shut off the emergency water system that would have cooled the core. If the operators had not intervened in that accident at Three Mile Island and shut off the pumps, the plant would have saved itself. They had thought of absolutely everything except what would happen if the operators intervened anyway. So the operators thought they were saving the plant by cutting off the emergency water, when in fact, they had just sealed its fate. Within minutes, the control room console went wild. Hundreds of lights started flashing, accompanied by piercing horns and sirens. One operator recalled that the console was lit up like a Christmas tree. There was such an avalanche of alarms that the operators couldn't really address any of those on a real-time basis. They were just catching up and trying to, trying to prioritize and handle the most important ones and do what they could. There was so much data being dumped to the computer 
and the process was so slow in, in getting it analyzed and printed out that when they'd go to look for data from their computer printout, it wasn't there until an hour and a half later. By early morning, the exposed part of the core was beginning to cook. Temperatures in the reactor were already reaching 4,300 degrees. At 5,200 degrees, meltdown. A scenario called the China Syndrome. The core could have turned into a molten white-hot mass, it could have gone through the concrete base of the plant and into groundwater, which is immediately below the foundation of the plant, could have fractured the earth instantly in all directions, and geysers of radioactive steam would have spouted uh, into the air uh, through the parking lots. And uh, a cloud of death would have wafted north over the city of Harrisburg. Operators remained convinced that the core was covered and safe. No one in the control room could see that Three Mile Island was hurtling towards meltdown. Most of us who had spent our lives in this business didn't believe that could happen. We had a mindset that said we had these marvelous safety systems which had backups of backups. So there was that mindset that I think made it hard for people to really come to grips with the reality that severe damage had occurred. As the operators struggled to make sense of the accident, workers throughout the plant flocked to the control room. By 6.15, the control room must have had 50, 60 people in it, more arriving every moment. And then they get the alarm, radiation in the control room. Well, that's got to be a heart stopper. Contaminated water from the open valve had leaked into an adjoining building and was releasing radioactive gases throughout the plant. With radiation threatening to escape to surrounding communities, Supervisor Gary Miller declared the first general emergency ever to arise at a nuclear power plant in the United States. The operators, grabbing their respirators, would remain at the helm of the runaway reactor. The radiation level inside the containment dome was reading 10,000 rems per hour. A dose so high, only minutes of exposure would prove fatal. For four hours, Three Mile Island had smoldered in silence. Shortly after 8 a.m., a local radio station began picking up the first hints of trouble. We first learned that something was wrong at Three Mile Island because our traffic reporter, he's out driving around, and he says, you know, I'm getting things on the scanners here. He says, are you picking this up? I, I, I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, well, apparently they're mobilizing some fire equipment and emergency people at Three Mile Island. And he said, oh, by the way, there's no steam coming out of the cooling towers. So now I'm thinking, hmm, something's really weird going on there. I called Three Mile Island, and the receptionist had been so harried that morning that she didn't know, she didn't listen to me. She just put me through to the control room. Now I hear all this commotion behind me, you know, in the background. There's a guy on the line. I tell him who I am. And I ask him, is there fire equipment there? And he says, I can't talk now, we've got a problem. And boy, didn't they ever have a problem. Okay, we have this news bulletin that we're going to get on right now. Here's Mike Pintek. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh... There is a general emergency at Metropolitan Edison Company's Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. A utility spokesman says there was a problem with a feed water pump this morning. As word of the accident slowly leaked to the outside world, the governor of Pennsylvania, Dick Thornburg, learned the news from his aides. The minute I heard that there had been an accident at a nuclear facility, I knew we were in another dimension. Thornburg immediately turned to Lieutenant Governor William Scranton III, chair of the state's emergency council. There had never been anything like this. It wasn't something you could see or, or feel or taste or touch. This, we were talking about radiation, but which generated an enormous amount of fear. Three Mile Island's parent company, Metropolitan Edison, or Met-Ed, told Scranton 
that no radiation had been detected off plant grounds. The Metropolitan Edison Company has informed us that there has been an incident at Three Mile Island, unit number two. Everything is under control. There is and was no danger to public health and safety. In his first statement to the press, the Lieutenant Governor confidently reiterated Met Ed's assurances. He would soon learn that his confidence had been misplaced. What I had said in the morning was there has been no significant off-site release, only to find out moments later that, in fact, there had been an off-site release. Uh, and the indignation that welled up within me was memorable. I still haven't gotten over that. It was at that point that I realized that we could not rely on Metropolitan Edison for the kind of information we needed to make decisions. Early that afternoon, the national press began converging at Three Mile Island's observation center. That all my employees acted properly. Would you characterize this accident as a close Met call? Ed had never faced a public relations crisis like this. Unprepared for the media onslaught, they chose Jack Herbine, an engineer with no prior press experience, as their spokesman. The question was, why didn't we notify the people? Uh, the accident. The incident occurred uh, this morning around 4 o'clock. The safety systems functioned uh, as they should have. In the first we press really conference, they were playing down the importance of what had happened in the plant. It was an incident. There was a problem. A valve leaked. The plant overheated. They had to shut the plant down, and uh, they were going to clean it up. Things are falling off right now, as I've indicated, that the coolant uh, injection systems are functioning properly. And, uh, we expect soon to be in the, in the cold shutdown condition. If you had gone home from that first press conference, you would have presumed that the problem would have been cleaned up overnight. I mean, that's the impression they gave us. I didn't buy it, and there were quite a few other people who didn't buy it. Radiation releases were of grave concern for Mayor Robert Reed. His community of Middletown lay just upriver from Three Mile Island. I remember a man by the name of Herbine, and when I asked him ab about the release and the time of the accident, he more or less uh, looked at it from the standpoint that, uh, Mayor, you don't know anything about nuclear energy. I am the expert. How dangerous did the power company tell you the situation was? Well, I talked to a representative from the company, and uh, he assured me that uh, there was really nothing that uh, you could be concerned about. Are you satisfied with that answer? Or do you want some answers? Uh... I think we will get better answers. I was angry from that Wednesday. Uh, in fact, I'm still angry. Uh, I just, I was just upset with the way things were being handled and the way we were lied to. That same day, the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission set up an emergency center in Bethesda, Maryland, to monitor the accident. Yeah, no, I was talking about the other one that they didn't put into operation yet. You need air and you need power, I guess, to keep that thing open. The NRC also dispatched several inspectors to Three Mile Island. As we were walking through the turbine building, which was basically like a ghost town, there was nobody around, we saw these two other people from the plant wearing their anti-contamination radiation suits. And they also had their respirator masks on also. This is very abnormal because this is an area of the plant no that normally is not contaminated and that you wouldn't need these. And it gave you the impression like there's something very wrong here. As the NRC inspectors entered the control room, they were shocked by what they saw. Everybody in the control room was in respirators, and so the communications between the operators and their supervisors and them and us and anybody that you had to talk to on the phone was all pretty difficult because of wearing the respirators. Everybody was talking through their hoses because they all had air breathing masks on and, and so when they would go to the telephones they were talking to Washington and trying to tell them what's going on. And I know there were a couple of times when I just took my respirator off and talked real quickly in the phone and put it back on and said okay well let's do it as quickly as I can but we just had to try to get the information through. 
There was no direct line between the control room and the emergency center in Bethesda. Only two regular telephone lines that were continually tied up. This is an emergency operator, national emergency. Oh, sorry. I have no circuits. I can't dial the number. Can you preempt somebody? Just a minute. Anyone calling into the control room heard only busy signals. For five hours, Babcock and Wilcox, the designers of the reactor, tried to reach the operators from their headquarters in Virginia. The designers of the plant down in Lynchburg could not get through under any circumstances, and they had to relay all the information through a regional NRC office in uh, King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, to uh, the Unit 1, uh, which is north of uh, the accident, and, and then a runner would run over to Unit 2 and read the gauge and run back and report this. So the people down here are getting fourth-hand information, which is largely incorrect and certainly incomplete, and they're passing back advice which doesn't make it all the way. Finally, Wednesday evening, an urgent message from Babcock and Wilcox got through to the control room. Get water moving through the core. As soon as the operators restarted the pumps, temperature and pressure in the reactor dropped and stabilized. 16 hours after it had begun, it appeared the accident was over. It was the first step in a nuclear nightmare. As far as we know, at this hour, no worse than that. On national television, viewers were assured the situation was under control. It's probably the worst nuclear reactor accident to date. There was no apparent serious contamination of workers. But nuclear In Washington, President Jimmy Carter was watching events closely. A trained nuclear engineer, he knew what could happen if there was damage to the core. On Thursday morning, the day after the accident, the chairman of the NRC, Joseph Hendry, was summoned before the House Subcommittee on Energy. You responded to a question asking how close the water came to the top of the rods with the, this statement, I don't know how close the water was to the top of the rods. If you don't know, then how can you say whether or not we were close to a core meltdown? I guess uh, based on just an assortment of aspects of uh, this incident that uh, uh, say we were nowhere near it, in my judgment. Obviously. Within the NRC, no one really thought that you could have a core meltdown. I mean, it was just, it was more maybe the Titanic sort of mentality that this plant was so well designed that uh, you couldn't possibly have a serious core damage. Oh, no, we won't go. The accident occurred at a time when a growing number of Americans questioned the safety of nuclear power. There was a perception that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was in bed with plant operators, not just this plant, but all plant operators. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission wasn't a regulatory commission, it was a promotional, it should have been called the Nuclear Promotional Agency. The economic turmoil of the 1970s had transformed the nuclear industry. Oil shortages had raised prices from $3 a barrel in 1972 to $30 a barrel by 1979. Enticed by the prospect of cheap energy, utility companies ordered scores of nuclear power plants. We had no control over the number of plants that came in the door. I mean, we were just like your driver's license bureau, and there are people lined up at your desk waiting for an eye exam and, and a driver's test. And we used to talk about inviting people in off the street to see if they didn't want to come work for the NRC because we really had more work than we could handle. And uh, we'd review a power plant maybe with 10 to 12 man years of effort. And you got to remember, it takes thousands of man years of effort to design a power plant. So we were putting in an extremely small audit. They scaled this thing up from the 100 megawatt demonstration plants, the, so, the sort of laboratory proof of concept nuclear power plants, to these 1,000 megawatt super plants like Zion and Dresden and, and, uh, and Three Mile Island without anything in between. These monster plants were something that they did not understand clearly. The valve that failed at Three Mile Island had malfunctioned 11 times before at other nuclear plants. But neither the designer of the reactor nor the NRC 
had taken corrective measures or issued a warning. Now that warning, if it had gone out to all the rest of the similar nuclear power plants, the accident at Three Mile Island would never have happened and that plant would have remained an anonymous sandbar in the middle of the Susquehanna. A number of people in the mid-70s left the NRC because they felt that safety concerns just weren't being taken seriously. The mindset, to be somewhat simplistic about it, was that everything was safe enough already, that uh, anyone who wanted to raise a new concern, anyone who was skeptical that a particular plant should be licensed, had an immensely heavy burden to demonstrate that it was worth really perturbing the process. Because nothing, nothing serious had happened yet, uh, or at least nothing serious enough had happened yet. Throughout Thursday morning, Governor Thornburg felt uneasy. The NRC had assured him that the danger was over, but he wanted a first-hand assessment of conditions at the plant. It occurred to me, someone's got to go down there and look at that place and see it. And, uh, and I being, you know, 30 years old and maybe thinking I was more immortal than I really was, said, I'm going to go down there. Three Mile Island was in the middle of the Susquehanna River, in the middle of farm country. So it's not like you've got a lot of large buildings around. I mean, you just drive up and there they are. They're magnificently huge, beautifully engineered symbols of the power of technological society to do good and the power of the technological society to do harm. And right now you know something's going on in there that you don't understand and it can be very dangerous. When he arrived on the island, the lieutenant governor asked to see the source of the radiation releases. Before he entered the highly contaminated area, Scranton was fitted with a protective suit. It was like getting ready to get into a spacesuit to go on a spacewalk. There were boots that fit over pants, and I mean, there was layer upon layer upon layer. I and mean, it took me 45 minutes to get in all of the suits and putting all the dosimeters on me so that they knew how much radiation I got and the protective boots and everything. And I remember walking in there, and I must say, I was quite unnerved the closer I got to it. When I started walking in, I looked down and I saw on the floor this water, which looked like you know water in your basement, except it happened to be in the auxiliary building of a, of a nuclear power plant. I realized that what was around me was highly contaminated. But I came back with a much clearer understanding of what was going on in that island. For on site, we were there for about two and a half hours. When I left the plant, I had been exposed to about 80 millirems. So I, and I feel fine. The tour left Scranton encouraged. Though there was contaminated water, he told the governor the problem seemed fixable. But in the early morning hours of Friday, it appeared the plant was once again out of control. It was reported that a large burst of radioactive gas had escaped from Three Mile Island. Within minutes, Thornburg received a startling recommendation from a staff member at the NRC to evacuate the area. For about 45 minutes in my office, with all of our team assembled, we set about uh, a crash effort to determine what had prompted this evacuation recommendation out of Washington, D.C. This whole question was constantly recycled. Uh, should we order an evacuation? Thornburg feared the prospect of a mass exodus. Earlier, he had directed an aide to review the state's emergency plans. His report to me on the evacuation plans was chilling, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, uh, one of the things I'll never forget was that he said that under the regimen that had been established by uh, the counties on either side of the river, uh, one Dauphin County where Harrisburg was and Cumberland County across the river, that their evacuees 
would meet head on in the middle of the bridge over which they were to be evacuated. The burden of the evacuation decision was on Thornburg's shoulders. Whatever he decided, he knew lives were at stake. The governor was anxious to get advice from the chairman of the NRC, but he got no reply. In Washington, Chairman Hendry was still trying to get a handle on the facts. Frustrated, Hendry told an aide, Thornburg's information is ambiguous. Mine is non-existent. We're like a couple of blind men trying to make a decision. As the governor waited to hear from Hendry, a siren blared across downtown Harrisburg. That siren was like a knife in my chest. It was just, I thought, what on earth? Where did that come from? Someone had set off Harrisburg's civil defense alarm, sending rumors of evacuation racing through the surrounding communities. Could I hear attention, please? There has been a state of emergency declared on Three Mile Island. Please stay indoors with your windows closed. For residents, life seemed to be imitating art. Just 12 days earlier, a Hollywood film called The China Syndrome had been released in theaters across the country, giving Americans their first look at a terrifying nuclear catastrophe. I don't know. They might have come close to exposing the core. If that's true, then we came very close to the China Syndrome. The number of people killed would depend on which way the wind is blowing, render an area the size of Pennsylvania permanently uninhabitable. It was a beautiful day, a very sunny, bright morning. My windows were open, my phone rang, and my sister wanted to know where I was going. She was calling from L.A. saying, get out, get out, hurry up and get out. And people around the country were calling and saying, you know, get out of there, hurry up and get out. Frightened residents braced themselves for the worst. Our neighbors told me that I was to come down to their house. They had guns and they had a chainsaw and a big truck. And they would get up on the highway, cut down any barriers that were there and fight their way through and we would leave any way they pleased. So the idea that there was going to be any kind of an orderly evacuation was pure fantasy. Thornburg knew he didn't have much time to stem the panic. Shortly after 10 a.m., he finally got some welcome news. The radiation release had been grossly overstated. One critical number had gotten distorted in layers of garbled communications. The explanation did little to calm frayed nerves. The crisis in Pennsylvania had made front page news around the world. Hundreds of journalists flocked into Harrisburg, including Mike Gray. An engineer by training, he was covering the accident for a national journal. He was also the screenwriter of the movie the China Syndrome. At one of the major New York dailies, the managing editor stood up on his desk and shouted, who here has seen the China Syndrome? Three guys raised their hand, he said, you, 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 you're going to Harrisburg. <coughs> so the movie then became a briefing film for the press. At 11 o'clock, Med Ed called another press conference. By now, the press corps was growing openly distrustful. The release that was made yesterday was within the limits that were acceptable, and was... I don't know why... I don't know why we need to, we need to, to tell you each and everything that, that, that we do. Well, why not, we Jack? You know, we only live here, and you may kill us here before you're all finished. Mr. Herbine, don't you feel a responsibility to a million people living around the planet to keep them informed of every last facet of... The press became very demanding. They were asking more and more intelligent questions and more and more specific uh, answers were demanded. And uh, each time, uh, Herbine tried to back away from it. And finally, the reporters got vicious. I'm here today to try and, and ease the level of panic and concern. 
and tell you that, tell you. I remember feeling very angry and I, I shouted a question to Jack Herbine, something along the lines of, you started to melt that thing down, didn't you? Didn't you? And in a, I, I guess at that moment, I was not a journalist anymore. I was, uh, I lived here and I was mad. I was angry. Yeah. Back at the State House, Thornburg finally heard from Hendry. All right. Uh, hello, this is Dick Thornburg. As a precaution, the chairman recommended a limited evacuation order. Based on advice of the chairman of the NRC, I am advising pregnant women and preschool aged children to leave the area within a five mile radius of the Three Mile Island facility until further notice. Thornburg's announcement unleashed the panic he had been trying to avoid. Within days, 140,000 people would flee the area. People left their jobs, came home, packed their cars and their children. And I remember standing on the corner and cars zipping past me and people hollering out the window, watch the town. And I said, well, here I am standing here. I'm in as much danger as they are. And they're leaving town and telling me to watch their homes. Mrs. Snyder, this is the bus we'll use for her. Things were starting to to get a little hectic. We left so quickly on Friday that we basically took ourselves. The moment that's so crystal clear in my mind is driving on the highway, trying to imagine what would happen to this area. All of this beautiful countryside would be destroyed would be so contaminated that nobody could be there for hundreds of years. I looked as hard as I could at everything and tried to burn it into my mind what everything looked like because I wasn't going to see it again. My father wouldn't leave. Dad was thinking of his neighborhood and he was going to stand guard. When I said goodbye to my father, we were both very careful not to say things more than we were to say things. I think we said goodbye, see you soon, to one another. Ask Murad and Snodden, which means stay in touch. I'll let you know. It was probably a few of the most horrible moments of my life. I had to drive away. It was horrible. At the White House, President Carter was becoming alarmed. For an hour, he'd been trying to call Governor Thornburg, but the phone lines were clogged. We had an open line. What happened to our open line? How about reestablishing that? It was on three. Okay? And there over there sits our hotline unassembled. When Carter finally reached the governor, he heard an outpouring of frustration. Thornburg felt let down by both Met Ed and the NRC. He asked the president for someone he could trust. Within hours, Harold Denton arrived in Harrisburg as the president's envoy. So I agreed to go, but I saw it at that time as I was a fireman and I was rushing to the scene of a, of a fire. We were in the governor's darkly oak paneled office and we were all sitting there three days and we'd been through everything and, and we didn't know what to expect. And we got a call saying Harold Denton is outside in the reception area and the governor turned to me and said, Bill, go and bring him in. And, and uh, I walked down, I opened the door and he stepped in and he said, hi, I'm Harold Denton. And I said, hi, I'm Bill Scranton. But the minute he said, hi, I'm Harold Denton, you know, sometimes you have this feeling about people 
it, it just was, this is the right guy. Hi. Hello, Governor. I'm Harold Denton. Harold Dick Thornburg. How are you? My first look at Harold Denton was on a television set, and he's kind of this slow talk in... Uh, I, my recollection is southern sounding kind of guy who will automatically puts you at ease and makes you feel more comfortable and safe. And that's kind of how it felt. Well, finally, somebody's here that we can trust. Uh, we've assured ourselves that there is no imminent danger to the public. Uh, that's Harold Denton. Uh, as a result of the way the core is being cooled, there are a number of safety As Denton calmed fears in Harrisburg, tensions were growing back at NRC headquarters. Roger Matson, one of the NRC's most experienced engineers, had been analyzing a stream of data from the control room. He was horrified to discover the presence of a hydrogen gas bubble above the core. The bubble could prevent cooling and eventually lead to a meltdown. Matson's report to Commissioner Hendry was blunt. Well, what I told them was that we had a reactor that was in a condition that no one had anticipated, that the core was severely damaged. Uh, I think I called it a horse race. How the hell do we get the bubble out of there? Do we win the horse race or lose the horse race? Uh, I don't know what we're protecting at this point. I think we ought to be moving people. And at that point, I put my two cents worth in on the evacuation. I asked him uh, why he was not making a recommendation to move people. But we thought that there should be some form of close-in evacuation. Fearing another false alarm, Hendry stalled. For the first time, the press began to use the word meltdown. The world has never known a day quite like today. It faced the considerable uncertainties and dangers of the worst nuclear power plant accident of the atomic age. And the horror tonight is that it could get much worse. The potential is there for the ultimate risk of a meltdown at the Three Mile Island. That Atomic evening Power before sundown, I went out and I'm looking in the sky. And I know this is kind of dumb, but I just remember the sky was the strangest colors of purples and, and oranges and, uh, and deep blues. And it was just a really weird sky. It almost reflected the, uh, the emotional turmoil that we were feeling over what was going on at Three Mile Island. So that's what comes to mind when I think of Friday or Black Friday, as I call it. Saturday morning, Chairman Hendry was at the point of exhaustion. The ominous prospect of a meltdown was frightening enough, but now he had a new worry, that the hydrogen bubble would mix with oxygen and create a devastating explosion. Hendry told Roger Matson to get the answers from the best nuclear physicists in the country. At the State House, the governor once again faced an agonizing decision. He could not bring himself to order an evacuation without more facts. Still, his team began preparing for the unthinkable. We were making plans for the evacuation of not only the people, but of government of how we were going to govern in the case of a massive meltdown and an escape of radioactivity. I mean, we were going through some very tough scenarios. Um, and not only were we going through tough scenarios, but these were tired, overworked, very stressed people. Back in Bethesda, reports from Matson's consultants began pouring in. The news was grim. There was a moment of truth for Roger Matson in calculating. He realized that he had one variable wrong that instead of talking about an explosion that could happen in a period of a day or two, that they were already at an explosive level. At any moment, the plant might explode. They were sitting on a time bomb. But at his makeshift office near Three Mile Island, Harold Denton was calm. He was getting a more optimistic assessment from his technical advisor, Victor Stello, a well-respected NRC engineer who was conferring with industry insiders. I think the Washington group was getting more concerned that it might already be an explosive mixture there. And Mr. Stello and his consultants were coming to the view that uh, it wasn't uh, any explosive potential at all. And we, we just couldn't seem to bridge that, that technical gap. The lives of tens of thousands of people now hinged on whose calculations proved right. In the early evening, Word of the explosion theory leaked to the press. 
By the time Harold Denton spoke to them at 11 o'clock at night, journalists were close to hysteria. In the state capitol were several hundred reporters who got the word that this thing may explode, and it's, you know, like a stone's throw down the river from where they're standing right at this moment. They went into the press room, and they weren't after a story. What they wanted to know was, is it time to get out? On Saturday night, I'm saying to myself, my life at about 27 years old is going to be over because these, these arrogant utility operators have allowed this thing to run out of control and they're going to kill us. There were still half a million people in the Harrisburg area waiting for Thornburg's order to leave. The governor would base his decision on Harold Denton's word. We see no, uh, no possibility of, of hydrogen explosions in either the containment or in the reactor vessel in the near term. With regard You've got to understand that people in Bethesda were saying, hey, we're nervous. But, by, but we didn't listen to people in Bethesda. I don't mean that you know, we were rude to them or cut them off, but frankly, we believed the people on site. And Harold Denton was the guy we trusted most by this time. But it's certainly days before uh, flammability limits would be reached, and many more days after that before detonation limits would be reached, all of which assume that we did nothing but sit on our hands here instead of uh, getting the hydrogen out of the vessel. Then Thornburg added some reassuring news. President Carter will be paying a visit to the area to make a personal on-site visit. And I think this is an important uh, vote of confidence and a further refutation of the kind of alarmist reaction that is set in in some quarters. I knew the president was arriving the next day and there wasn't anyone on my staff at the site who thought that was anything dangerous or that we shouldn't, or that we should object. And yet in Washington, there was building sentiment that maybe it was an unwise thing for the, uh, the president to do. It's a great public relations gimmick to calm people down, but only if the plant doesn't explode. And as far as Matson was concerned, the plant was already explosive. Any kind of a vibration might set it off. On Sunday morning, Victor Stello went to church. He had worked through the night trying to prove the explosion theory wrong. I went to Mass and I was really retired. I thought I was going to fall asleep at the sermon. And then the priest gets up and said that because of the potential for us being killed from Three Mile Island, we're going to have general absolution. The bishop has said, George, you're the pastor. Whatever you need to do, whatever you need to say, is up to you to do. You need make no calls to me, ask for any permission. And that's how we decided to give general absolution. But he also said, I've been in- This is a sacrament the in the Catholic faith, faith, reserved when death is imminent. It is only given when people are going into battle and they might die. Uh, so they are absolved of all of their sins. A very difficult and emotional kind of a thing. A very difficult time. And then the anger was really bad. What we had done to these people, just outrageous. Uh, we, we had frightened them so bad. Uh, they thought they were gonna die. While Stello attended church, Roger Matson raced to Harrisburg. He set off from Washington, determined to reach Three Mile Island before the president arrived. At the airport, he found Denton and Stello waiting to greet the president's helicopter. Here comes Roger Matson into the hangar, and here's Victor Stello, the other top NRC expert. And Stello says, Matson, you son of a bitch! Uh, how could you be spreading these rumors around this about this hydrogen bubble? And, and Matson is saying, you know, Victor, that bubble is ready to explode, and if you can't see that, you're crazy. And they're screaming back and forth at each other inside this hangar. This had to be a fairly thrilling moment for Harold Denton as the president's deputy, because here is the president, the chief executive, due to arrive at any moment with his wife. And here are his two top technical experts slugging it out there in the hangar over whether or not the place is about to blow up. Minutes later, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter landed at Harrisburg Airport. For Harold Denton, this was the moment of decision. 
So I briefed the president on this bubble and the possibility of an explosive mixture and tried to give him the two sides that were out there. But we still didn't have a single view on that. Now this has to put Carter on a spot. Um, what is he to do? If he turns around and walks away after he's come up here in order to calm the public down, that message is unmistakable. And so he did the only thing he felt he could. He went into the plant anyway. They left the hangar at Harrisburg Airport and went down the river road to Three Mile Island. And uh, watching that motorcade that day was uh, a remarkable experience because there were people who had tried to stick it out through thick and thin, uh, been advised, uh, get out of town, no, no, it's safe. Uh, Pregnant women should leave, uh, uh, but everybody else is okay. Uh, and they've been whipsawed back and forth with uh, leave, don't leave, it's uh, about to explode, no it isn't. And all of a sudden, here is the President of the United States coming down the highway, <laughs> leading this entourage to take a personal tour of the plant itself. And they stood there and they cheered as he went by because he was with them. I remember all of us were outfitted with these little yellow booties that uh, we put on over our shoes. And uh, that was to uh, protect us from water that was uh, radioactive water, which was on the uh, floor inside the facility. And then we uh, went to the site, we all got on a bus. And the bus then went on site. We got out, went into the control room. And that was an eerie feeling. Here we were Sunday morning, uh, four days plus a couple of hours after the accident, at the very site where things had gone wrong. Just outside the plant gates, Victor Stello and Roger Matson were frantically reviewing the explosion theory. For two days, Stello had struggled to prove Matson wrong. Finally, in the late afternoon, Victor Stello found the flaw in Matson's calculations. They were using the wrong formula. The hydrogen bubble was never a threat. What puzzles me is how many people not just in the NRC, not just at Three Mile Island, but people in the industry on the phone as technical consultants, technical consultants who were on site. How many of them dealt with that formula and nobody noticed? Now scientists and engineers were correctly assessing the accident. But back on the island, there was still confusion. When we reached the gate to turn back in our dosimeters that we had worn, the president reads his dosimeter and it's reading high, it's 78 milliram. Oh my God, you know, my heart stuff, what has happened here? Have I exposed present? And I read mine, which was an NRC issued dosimeter, it read zero. Turns out the company had gotten so far behind on their ability to recharge dosimeters and hand out fresh dosimeters to everyone, they just noted what they read when they were turned in last and subtracted the difference. And the plant people didn't see any big deal, but Momentarily, there was mass confusion on the bus, and everyone was thinking they had received an unexpected exposure. And I think at that moment, <laughs> President Carter began to lose a little confidence in not only the company, but me. By the time Carter left Harrisburg, he knew the danger was over. The president's visit would mark the end of the crisis. After five days of fear and anguish, residents felt safe enough to return to their homes. Although they were told that an insignificant amount of radiation had been released during the accident, they would be plagued by doubts for years to come. On the island, lead bricks were brought in to build a wall around the reactor.
Slowly, the hydrogen was bled from the system. A month after the accident began, the Unit 2 reactor was finally shut down. I don't see how you could ever erase the memories of frustration, of uncertainty, punctuated by moments of stark terror that attach to an incident like Three Mile Island and the eternal sense of relief and deliverance when that was finally over. Three years later, a robotic camera was lowered into the core. It would be the first look at the full extent of the accident. And I remember vividly seeing this videotape of a camera coming down into the top of the core, and you hear the voice of the mechanic who's, who's lowering it saying, one foot, two foot. Two feet into the core. We're now approaching three feet. And as he's going, as I'm watching the tape, my stomach churns more. We are approaching four feet. We're now five. That's something. We're and that five. recognition for the first time, five feet of the core was gone. That's when we really saw that the core had been severely damaged. We had a meltdown at Three Mile Island. It was not the China syndrome, but we melted the core down. 50% of the core was destroyed or molten and um, some, something on the order of 20 tons of uranium found its way by flowing in a molten state to the bottom head of the pressure vessel. That's a core meltdown. No question about it. Following the accident, the nuclear power industry would introduce new safety and training standards. But nuclear power would not hold the promise it once did. Since Three Mile Island, not a single nuclear power plant has been ordered in the United States. To order Meltdown at Three Mile Island on video cassette, call PBS Home Video at 1-800-PLAY-PBS.